This is the second part of my two videos on Althusser randomness teleology. Althusser had been opposed to teleology in his earlier writings, critiquing an a teleological approach to history. And in Philosophy of the Encounter he develops this further into an alternative view of history, stochastic materialism, which emphasises the radical contingency instead of viewing the past in what he calls the future anterior tense. What do you mean by the future anterior? He means that, at, for example, viewing the French Revolution as if it was there in order to bring about French society in the 20th century, in or, as if its purpose was to create the future French society. And in doing this, he goes into some very deep questions, questions which were central to 20th century and late 19th century science. Now when you look at these things you always come to them with a background and Althusser is a philosopher so he traces it down through the history of philosophy from Epicurus, Machiavelli, Spinoza, Hobbes and Marx and he starts with Epicurus notion of the atoms falling in the void and the swerve this is a quote from Lucretius giving an account of Epicurus' ideas. We wish thee also well aware of this. The atoms, as their own weight would bear some down, plumb through the void at scarce determined times, in scarce determined places, from their course, decline a little, call it so to speak, a mere chance trend. For were it not their want thus wise to swerve, down would they fall, each one like drops of rain through the unbottomed void, and then collisions ne'er could be nor blows among the primordial elements, and thus nature could never have created aught. So this is Lucretius' account of the cosmogony of Lucretius, or of Epicurus. Epicurus' account of how the world came to be, how things came to be, that you had an initial falling of atoms and then a slight decline whereby some banged into one another and the banging into one another grew and grew until solid bodies were formed. Now that view seems rather familiar. Uh, we no longer talk of things falling in the void, but we have the idea of them fleeing out from the Big Bang. And the problem for the cosmologists is to explain why they didn't just keep on expanding uniformly into the void. And the explanation they give is that there were quantum fluctuations in the initial symmetry, and that these quantum fluctuations in the first tiny fraction of a second of the Big Bang resulted in variations in density from which the subsequent seeding of the galaxies came about. Now this is pretty much the same sort of theory as Epicurus and Lucretius had. Contingency and randomness in the initial conditions produces huge effects. So our Earth is a side effect of a cosmic throw of the dice 11 billion years ago. Now, atomism is so generally accepted in the current world that we forget how recently it was re-accepted. The Greeks thought of atomism, but it wasn't generally accepted. Uh, Maxwell and Boltzmann's theories of heat in the 19th century 
were based on atomism and Dalton had proposed atoms for chemical reasons. But a lot of the scientific community remained sceptical. The positive philosopher um, Mach opposed the idea of um, atoms being real things. He thought they were just um, useful hypotheses. And Mach, of course, and his opposition to atomism was a central um, target of Lenin's criticism in materialism and imperial criticism. And Boltzmann, who established statistical mechanics and of course was an atomist because of that, faced so much opposition within the German academic community for his adherence to a materialist theory that Boltzmann eventually committed suicide. And then when you look at that, at this scepticism towards materialism, the scepticism towards atomism, which was penetrating within the social democratic movement, you realise why Lenin embarked on his foray into philosophy, materialism and empirical criticism. And he showed great foresight in coming down against Marx's ideas, which were then fashionable. And it wasn't until 1905 in Einstein's paper on the Brownian motion, that the existence of atoms was finally accepted in the scientific community. He, since Einstein showed that Brownian motion was the result that you should expect to get if water was made up of collection of atoms or molecules which were bumping into pollen grains whose um, Brownian motion you could observe. Now, you can't have atomism without chance. And it's a great virtue of Boltzmann uh, that he stood natural philosophy on the foundation of probability, not absolute determinism. And this shift from a physics of prob to a physics of probability and randomness started with Boltzmann and continues with the quantum theory of the atom. Now, since atoms are tiny, we can't detect them individually. And we know from Heisenberg's principle that we can't both know their positions and momenta. But Boltzmann argued that it's possible to reason about how a collection of atoms will behave. The unknown positions and momenta of a gas or a liquid are its degrees of freedom. And in his thermodynamics, he just uses classical Newtonian mechanics and the conservation of momentum and energy from which he is able to arrive at a purely probabilistic derivation of the law of increasing entropy, something which had already been known experimentally and by engineers working with steam engines. I'm not going to go into... Um, Boltzmann's law just here. So the key concepts that Althus is concerning himself with are already dealt with in Boltzmann. Randomness and a direction to time. And these turn out to be really useful for other reasons. And reasons which uh, show that Althusser was not quite up to the to speed on things. In um, Philosophy of the Encounter, Althusser says, "What are we to think of a theory which sets itself the goal of demonstrating the production of prices of production, starting out from value, and succeeds only at the price of a mistake by leaving something out of the calculation?" Sraffa, Gramsci's old friend who emigrated to England, Sraffa and his school must be given credit for closely checking Marx's demonstrations on this point and discovering to their amazement that the demonstration was erroneous. The error has deep roots. It is rooted precisely in the principle that it is necessary to begin with the simplest element, the first, namely the commodity or value, 
whereas the simple form is neither simple nor the simplest. So what we have here is Altus are seem, seeming fairly up to date with the position that was being expressed in the Communist parties on economics circa 1971, say. They were fairly common uh, right until uh, the early 1980s. But in the 1980s, Farjun and Makova used techniques derived from Boltzmann to show that Sraffa was wrong. And subsequent empirical research has shown that reality matches the predictions of Farjun and Makova and not those of Sraffa. So although Althusser is a proponent of randomness, when he touches on political economy, which is actually a central question for Marxism, he sides with determinism, not with randomness. So, in the end, it is the randomness which Althusser is in favour of, which destroys his own criticism of Marx. But in also, in a different way from Straffer, Fangeon and Makova are able to show that the price theory in volume three is wrong, whereas volume one is correct. Althusser was thinking volume three is correct, volume one is wrong, and volume three can't be deduced from volume one, whereas in fact volume three turns out to be wrong. So is Althusser's critique of Marx's methodology correct? So let's look at what Farjun and Makova said and compare that with the way Marx proceeded and compare that with Newtonian method and to see to what extent Hegelian idealism can be blamed for holding back Marx's economics. Now, a capitalist economy is a, co a chaotic system. It's like a gas. It's got large numbers of agents, which you can see as equivalent to the atoms. And we don't know what their individual behaviour is. There are millions of individual economic transactions buying and selling things for money every day. And you can't predict the price at which every economic interaction will take place any more than you can say something about the velocity of every atom in a gas. Instead, you have to use Boltzmann-style re reasoning to arrive at predictions about probability distributions of prices and profits. Fangin and Makova showed that if you do this, the prices of commodities will closely correlate with their labour content, and that Marx was right in Volume 1 of, Th one of Capital. They give an explanation of why the labour theory of value is empirically correct. Up until then, the labour theory of value was seen as sort of rough empirical rule of thumb, without any theoretical support. It was like classical thermodynamics before Boltzmann an empirical generalisation with no causal mechanism. But the application of stochastic materialism by Farjun and Makanova showed that it's a necessary effect of probabilistic interactions. So materialism aleatoire rescued, Mark, rescued theory from the impasse that Althusser was pointing out. Now, this wasn't uh, the first time stochastic processes had been raised or thermodynamic style processes had been raised. Um, Engels tried to think it through as well. He, he tried to think of things through in terms of statistical ag aggregates. So there's a quote from Engels in one of his letters. In the second place, history always forms itself in such a way that the ultimate result springs always from the conflict of many individual wills each of which in its turn is produced by a quantity of special conditions of life. There are thus innumerable forces which cross each other, an infinite group of parallelograms of forces from which is derived one resultant historical event. 
and which in its turn again can be considered as the product of an active power as a whole unconsciously involuntary and because of that with it which each individual wishes is prevented by every other and that which results is a thing which no one wished in this way history runs its course like a natural process and has substantially the same laws of motion what Ma what engels is saying here is very much the conceptual framework of Boltzmann and Machover. Now, let's compare Marx, Hegel and Newton. Marx admits to playing with Hegelian modes of exposition in capital. We know that. But is his method of going from abstract to con um, concrete deduction correct from the standpoint of science did it fit in with what was then known best scientific practice i.e. that of Newton Newton says for all the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist of this from the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature and then from these forces to demonstrate other phenomena so the method of Newton was to, from experiment and observation, to formulate laws of motion. He then deduces via ge geometry to derive special general properties, for instance, of centripetal, force, centripetal forces. Having d done that, he then looked in the latter part of uh, Newton's Principia at the periods and orbital radii of the satellites of Jupiter to deduce that the gravitational force must be inverse square. Now, how does he do that? In volume one of the Principia, Newton says, suppose the centripetal force is inversely proportional to distance. Suppose it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Suppose it's inversely proportional to the cube of the distance. What is the relationship under each circumstances that you get between orbital periods and orbital um, radii? And shows that in each of these cases, they vary in a different way. He then looks at Jupiter and Saturn, the, the satellites of Jupiter and the satellites of Saturn, and shows that they follow the relationship between orbital radius and orbital period that you would expect from an inverse square law. So from that he deduces that there is an inverse square law of gravitation. And from the inverse square law of gravitation, he then deduces other things. For instance, more accurate predictions about planetary orbits, uh, the precession of Mercury, the formation of um, the shape of the Earth as, an, as being flattened by the balance between centrip centripetal and centrifugal forces. All of that he can, he can then deduce. Now, in a sense, Marx, uh, in a sense, Newton is moving from the abstract to the concrete. But his first ones are based on observation. And compare this with what Marx is doing. In both cases, they form formalized conservation laws. Newton starts off with equal and opposite action, conservation of momentum. Marx starts off with equal values are exchanged in commodity exchange and that the sum of values exchanged is conserved in trade or in, in commerce. And these initial uh, axioms are observationally based. Marx's lists of general and equivalent forms are basically taking down price lists which then existed in Victorian England. They then move from abstract laws to concrete con conclusions in each case. Newton looks at centripetal forces. He shows that they sweep, sweep equal areas in equal time if they're inverse square law and therefore 
compares that with reality and concludes gravitational force is an inverse square law. Marx makes um, other similar deductions of time evolution from his basic laws, which is that the rate of profit must fall as capital and accumulation intensifies. But Marx actually violates one of Newton's laws. Newton has the following um, rather odd rule. He says, in experimental philosophy, we are to look upon propositions collected by general induction from the phenomena as accurate or very nearly true, notwithstanding any contrary hypotheses that may be imagined. This rule we must follow, that the argument of induction may not be evaded by hypotheses. Now, that seems very odd, because nowadays you're taught that scientists have hypotheses. But what Newton is talking about is general hypotheses a priori hypotheses like for example the Ptolemaic hypothesis that the earth must be at the center of the universe he's saying you can't start off with a hypothesis like that and the basic problem with volume 3 of Capital is that Marx introduces an imagined hypothesis, profit rate e equalization, which wasn't based on any accurate observations. Newton is saying you carry out accurate observations, you deduce general laws of motion, you make predictions from these, you then look at other observations to select which form of law must be applied. Sraffa and implicitly alters her hold to an imagined hypothesis equalization of the rate of profit and seek to use this to invade the argument of induction that commodities exchange in proportion to the labor process by following the maths rigorously Fajun and Makova were able to show the redundancy of this imagined hypothesis now this is contrary, I know, to the way you'll have been taught positivist theory of science or that you form a hypothesis and you test it. Newton is not saying that. He says you have to avoid hypotheses. You have to be based very closely on what you can observe. So let's look at the issue of contingency in history. Althusser is concerned about this for a long time uh, and he emphasizes this in, in his analysis or, or the necessity for the analysis of concrete conjunctures and what he thought was the great virtue of Lenin was his ability to concretely analyze situations and decide what policy should take place in a concrete conjuncture rather than deducing it from general principles. And Althusser argues against a simple deterministic view that slavery leads in inevitably to feudalism, which inevitably leads to capitalism. Instead, he says it was a set of contingent factors that, for instance, gave rise to capitalism in England and not in Italy in the Middle Ages. But if we accept that, if history is radically contingent, what, hap what becomes of historical materialism? One thing you could say is that there are no general laws governing transitions, only particularities. And then you'd throw out teleology and throw out grand narratives altogether. And Alters would be siding with the right wing in French philosophy. But it's, it's still maybe possible to construct a non-deterministic theory in fact, it is possible to construct a non-deterministic theory of historical change by borrowing the modes of thoughts that other sciences use when they study things which take place through time. Human history comes after biological 
history or biological time. And before there were humans, there were other primates. Before there were primates, there were primitive mammals like multituberculates and other primitive mammals. Before these, there were reptiles, fish, worms, etc. And this rise in complexity came about by a random process. Random cosmic radiation gave rise to mutations in cells. And selective pressure then selected a few of these which were su suited to the environment and complexity accumulated. So we have a good precedent for arguing that directed outcomes or directional outcomes can arise from contingency. Whether you measure the outcome in terms of the number of species, the complexity of the um, ecological webs, etc. And there are other ways of thinking about these, and one of them is the Markov process. Uh, Markov developed these as a way of modeling language but they are widely used in the sciences now as a way of modeling things which have a certain number of states and undergo probabilistic transitions between them. Um, Markov did this, for instance, to model the formation of a text on the assumption that a person writing text can be in two states, writing a vowel or writing a consonant. So if you're writing a vowel, you have a 55% chance that the next symbol you'll generate is a consonant and a 45% chance that the next symbol will be vowel. If you're in a consonant, the next the probability is 0.6 that the next one will be a consonant and 0.4 that it'll be a vowel. Now, th these are rough probabilities. I'm not, get, I'm not saying that that's exactly what applies. But Markov arrived at this as a way of modeling someone writing text. And the founder of information theory, Shannon, provided performed similar analysis of texts. Markov did it for Russian texts, Shannon did it for English. And Shannon dealt with higher order Markov models, one where the probability of a transition between two letters depended not only on the last letter, but the last two letters, for example. And if you construct such probabilistic models, you, you can, of, the, of transition probabilities in text, and train it on, for example, uh, the Bible I think I used, um, you can generate entirely random generators which have a, a strange familiarity. So the angel who talked with me, an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, so will we do, if God permits. For concerning those who were with me, Jacob served seven years for Rachel. They seemed to him and they wept. And he said to the woman, You won't surely die, and we will also serve Yahweh, for I am as you swore to her. Now that's entirely generated randomly, from statistical probabilities of word transitions in, in the Bible, using the World English Bible. Uh, transition probabilities, third order Markov model, using words as individual symbols. Now, you can generate Markov models of text, but in principle, you could also apply Markov models to modes of production. So suppose you've got feudal, proto-capitalist and, and fully industrial capitalist. And you could say that in any given period, let's say a, a century, um, there's a 0.9 probability that feudalism will reproduce itself. But a 0.1 probability that it'll go to proto-capitalist. But proto-capitalist societies have only a 0.25% probability of moving to full industrial capitalism and a 0.4% probability of reverting to feudalism. So here we can account for the kind of things that Althusser is talking about, that you have, it's a contingent matter, a random matter, 
with a proto-capitalist society like Renaissance Italy develops into industrial capitalism or reverts to basically a feudal form of economy or stays in that, that, that proto-capitalist form. If you actually run that model, simulate that model from the fall of the Roman Empire up until the present, you see that there's a directional trend. The probability that society is in a feudal mode declines and the probability that society is in the capitalist mode rises over time. And you can therefore model, using Markov model, Markov techniques, the sorts of thing historical materialism is um, concerned with. So you can combine contingency with long-term trends. But the long-term trends are probabilistic, they're not certain. So what would the object of historical materialism in Markov terms be? It's not going to be a theory of particular histories. Such histories are simply accomplished facts. Instead, what your object of investigation is ensemble and their possible histories. The circles that I've labelled feudalism, industrial capitalism, etc. are not instances of particular capitalist or feudal formations. It's not feudal France in the 3rd of April 1217 or industrial Japan, Japan on the 26th of February 1969. No, what they are in, is in statistical terms macrostates bundles of huge numbers of microstates, ones that have existed and ones that potentially could exist. And such ensemble are necessary for the idea of probability to have any meaning, because probability is defined in terms of relative frequency in ensemble. And if you're going to do historical materialist research this way, what we've got to do is construct parameterizable Markov models in which we can identify plausible macrostates and estimate the transition probabilities between them. Obviously where this is relevant in the current day is transitions to and from socialism because we know that you can have a transition to socialism you can also have a transition back out of socialism. Now the model I had there I picked them just out of the air as seeming roughly right when I, when I evaluate them over time, I find that between 1800 and 1900, it becomes more probable that social formations become capitalist. That implies that that simple model has roughly the right orders of magnitude. But we obviously need lots more states. We need to, to model it in more detail. There's always a temptation to generalize from narrow data. Uh, before planets around other stars were de detected, everyone thought that other solar systems would be like ours. You'd have rocky planets in the middle, gas giants further out, etc. As soon as people started to observe other solar systems, we find all sorts of things you don't expect. Like you find there are lots of gas giants in close orbits around their stars. Again, when you only had one socialist revolution, the 1917 ones, uh, Marxists assumed that all future revolutions would be similar to this. They only had one example to go on. And that's better than having zero examples, but it, in machine learning you have a concept of overfitting where you construct learned models on too few observations. The theory of revolution that the Comintern had in 1920 fitted Russia in 1917 perfectly, but had very little predictive value outside of it. But over the last couple of centuries, there have been lots of revolutionary and potentially revolutionary conjunctures. There are probably enough of these that you could make a reasonable attempt using modern machine learning techniques to construct a, a Markov model of revolutionary conjunctures using techniques like support vector machines or linear discriminant analysis to understand when conjunctures are likely to be revolutionary and when they're not.
and those of you who are data scientists and are willing to engage in a, a research project that will take them a few, deca uh, a few years, possibly decades, that might be something worth paying your attention to.